It was too tall for this pulpit with those shoes on. So welcome back, everyone. It's an interesting day in here today, isn't it? It's a little interesting. It's a little, little swirly, a lot of excitement and some interesting things. But you know what? This, this is God's house. There's other God's houses here in town. But this is, this is one that he loves to meet in. We're here to pursue Jesus. And you know what? When we're pursuing Jesus, part of that is sharing his goodness with other people too, right? And we want everybody to encounter Jesus. And we want everybody to feel welcome in God's house. We're all one big happy family. There's no us and them. And I just want to say, if we think that there's an us and them, we're wrong. That's pride. And it's gross. And we don't want to have it. Jesus. But this morning, we're all here together, and you're in different walks of life, and you might be struggling with different stuff, and you might be joyful in different things, but truly, we are all Papa's kids, and um, you know, I love Michael Ellis, he's probably with the kiddos now, he's teaching Sunday school, I love what he shared this morning, wasn't that special? Yeah. And I'm so glad, Bree, that you didn't just rush on to the next thing, um, and how many of you encountered the Father in that moment when we just closed our eyes and looked at the Father? Raise your hand. I did too. It was really special. And you know what I saw? I, I didn't see God the Father, but I, was, I went back to a memory in my, actually when I was about Taylor's age, probably a little younger. My dad is a really good dad, and actually he's not here this morning. Um, for those of you that don't know, he just had back surgery. Um, and he's recovering from that. So, hi, Dad, if you're watching on the streaming. We miss you, and my mom is taking care of him. Um, but I, I, when I closed my eyes to look at the Father this morning, I went back to a memory that I had, that I had a lot of these memories. I love basketball. I love volleyball. You guys hear me talk about volleyball a lot. Um, because that's what my kids are into. But I loved basketball too, and I was much better at basketball than I was at volleyball, even though know, I thought I was really a stud at volleyball. Um, but my dad was an awesome coach, and um, his dad was an awesome coach, and that was something that they had in common. And my parents had um, a gravel driveway and, you know, when you're practicing basketball around the driveway is not the best thing to practice on. And so, for, I couldn't really dribble the ball and practice, like, layups and stuff like that. So, my dad would go outside, rain or shine, with me and stand in various locations and just give me the hardest pass. Because that's what I wanted. I was like, Dad, I, I need you to pass to me so I can do these layups. So he would just keep, give me this hard pass on my way to do the layup, and uh, you know, so I could do my my steps without traveling. But I wouldn't have to dribble the ball, or he throw me out a, a jump shot, so I wouldn't have to dribble the ball on the on the gravel. And I'd practice jump shots, or he'd throw me one over there so I could practice a hook shot. And I went back to that memory of us in the drop in the gravel driveway of him just throwing me passes, and. Like, adjust this, adjust coaching me in basketball. And I just thought, okay, Father, that's the memory you want to show me this morning of your relationship with me, but it was, that was our thing. And the Father is just so happy to show up in your thing. Yeah. And what speaks to you and what moves your heart. And I needed him to do that this morning. That was a really grounding thing for me this morning. So I loved that experience, and I hope that um, he will just continue to do that this morning as we jump into the Word. Um, we don't tend to just dig into books of the Bible 
and teach out of the books of the Bible for a season of time, like a specific book and go all the way through it here, or more like prophetic and the flow. And, you know, the Lord spoke to me today out of this scripture, so I'm going to jump into this scripture and we'll teach out of the Bible. Obviously, we love the Bible here. But I can't remember the last time we went through a book and taught it. And the Lord was speaking to me about doing that. And he, he said, I want you to teach the book of John. And so we're going to do that. And um, for this next chunk of time, we're going to jump into the book of John. I'm going to, everybody that teaches, whether it's me or Mike Brink is going to share, my dad will share, different ones of us will share and teach out of the book of John. But we're going to jump into it through the Passion Translation. And so I just want to give a, a little plug. If you don't already have the Passion Translation, it's available for free on Bible Gateway app. So if you don't have that app on your phone and you have a smartphone, um, download Bible Gateway and the Passion Translation is available on that app. And then you can travel along with us at the same translation. So let's just pray before we start. Father, I thank you for revealing yourself to us this morning and revealing yourself to us in the way that we understand, in the way that we hear, in a way that moves our heart. Because Lord, you want to speak to us at a heart level. You want to speak to us with things that um, go into our heart and go into our spirit, that go beyond our mind, go beyond our natural understanding. And so, Papa, I just pray right now today that we would see you, we would feel you, we would experience you in our hearts today. And as we dive into your word, into the revelation of Jesus, through the book of John, I pray, Lord, that we would be changed. We would be more like you. And we would understand who you are more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to just dive in. We're going to jump in this morning, and we're going to do John 1, 1 through 18. This is, this is like some of my favorite section of the Bible right here. John 1 is in my top five, probably. I love this section, and we just can't go too fast, so we're just going to go through John 1, 1 through 18. So, here we go. You ready? Hey. In the very beginning, the living expression was already there. We could just preach on that all day. In the very beginning, the living expression was already there. And the living expression was with God yet fully God. They were together, face to face, in the very beginning. And through his creative inspiration, this living expression made all things, for nothing has existence apart from him. Life came into being because of him, for his life is life for all humanity. And this living expression is the light that bursts through gloom, the light that darkness could not diminish. Then suddenly a man appeared who was sent from God, a messenger named John. For he came to be a witness to point the way to the light of life and to help everyone believe. John was not that light, but he came to show who was. For he merely was a messenger to speak the truth about the light. For the light of truth was about to come into the world and shine upon everyone. And he entered into the very world he created. Yet the world was unaware. He came to the very people he created, to those who should have recognized him, but they did not receive him. But those who embraced him and took hold of his name were given authority to become the children of God. He was not born by the joining of human parents, or from natural means, or by a man's desire, but he was born of God. 
And so the living expression became a man and lived among us. And we gazed upon the splendor of his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came, who came from the Father, overflowing with tender mercy and truth. And John taught the truth about him when he announced to the people, He's the one! Set your hearts on him. I told you he would come after me. And even though he ranks far above me, for he existed before I was even born, now, out of his fullness, we are fulfilled. And from him, we receive grace, heaped upon more grace. Moses gave us the law, but Jesus, the anointed one, unveils truth wrapped in tender mercy. No one has ever gazed upon the fullness of God's splendor except the uniquely beloved Son who is cherished by the Father and held close to his heart. And now, he has unfolded to us the full explanation of who God truly is. I love that translation. So we're going to go through it a little bit more um, step by step. And I want you to pay attention to these things when we're reading the text. I want you to notice perhaps for maybe the first time certain things. Hear it like it's you've never heard it before. And if you have a pen and paper, write down questions that you might have. And one of the questions that I want you to ask just straight away is, what does this say about the heart of God? What does this say, what we're reading right now, say about the heart of God? And what does this say about me when I think about the heart of God? Okay? So we just heard... Um, in verse 1, in the very beginning, the living expression was already there. So I'm going to ask you a question. Who is the living expression? Say it loud. Specifically, he's God, but specifically who? Jesus Christ. That's right. I'm going to read um, this translator's notes. He has, Brian Simmons is an amazing theologian and linguistics um, expert, and he studied all the different, he, he took this translation out of the Septuagint um, and also out of the Aramaic and out of the Hebrew. And so that's the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Aramaic. And he compared words together um, and, and brought this translation out. And so um, it says it says that the, um, the living expression, Jesus Christ, could also be translated, so many many translations you'll see, and in the beginning was the Word, and then the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? That's what most of the translations say. So this, this word can be um, translated as Word. It also could be translated as message or blueprint. And I like that word blueprint when you think about um, in the beginning was the blueprint. This is the blueprint for the full expression of who God is. In the beginning was the word. In, be in the beginning was the message. In the beginning was the blueprint. Jesus Christ is the eternal word. He's the creative word. And he's the word made visible. He's the divine self-expression of all that God is, contains and reveals in incarnated flesh. And just as we express ourselves in words, God has fully ex expressed himself through Christ. So think about that. God the Father has fully expressed himself through Christ. Does that make sense to you? Everything that God has wanted to say to us about who he is... <laughs> If you were to take all of the words that he could possibly muster up in the language that, whether it's Aramaic or Hebrew or Greek or English, if he took all of the words that were known to humanity and put them together to say, this is who I am, he put them all into flesh, named Jesus Christ, and said, this is the living expression of who I am. So that's like a 
a very important thing to make note of this morning when we think about in the beginning was the word. It's not just this word. It's not just in the beginning was the Bible. In the beginning were all of the words that could ever be spoken to express fully who God is. So I'm, I have to go back and forth from a couple different things here, so bear with me with my technical skills. So I want us to ask this question first off. Who is God? What is he like? I'm reading this out of um, Brian Simmons, uh, just the, the, the beginning part of the John, book of John. Who is God? What is he like? Is he angry? Is he ready to hurl lightning bolts down on unsuspected humans? Is he an unblinking cosmic stare who can't be bothered by our problems? No, he's not. We know that, right? Today we begin a fascinating journey into this crucial question of faith, discovering a shocking answer from the start. God isn't distant. He's not removed, but he's very present, and he's a very loving person. He's, per he's a person. He's God, and he's a person. We meet him as the living expression. What we're going to see, not just today in the book of John, but in the coming weeks, is that John the disciple has given us a really unique view of God. Unlike the other books, uh, the other gospels, his, his vantage point is as John the beloved. He comes to us with a really deep connection to the person of Jesus. A really deep relationship with God in the flesh. And so many of the other gospels come to us almost like they're awesome, right? When you read Mark and you read about all, all the miracles in the book of Mark, it's exciting. But in Luke, it's almost like they're historians taking notes. Matthew is like very much into showing all the intricacies of these were the prophetic foretellings of Christ. And he tries to bring back the, you know, the Old Testament connection to it. And he starts out in the genealogy showing us the way, like, of course he's the one. Of course he's the one. But John comes to us, and he shows us Jesus is God in the flesh. He's passionate about us. He wants to do life with us. He, he was one of us. He, he expresses Jesus, the living expression, as Emmanuel, God with us. And so that's why I'm excited for us to encounter God um, through this book, because it's it's not like any other. Okay, so in the beginning, Genesis one five is very one. I'm sorry, Genesis one one through five is very similar to John one one through five. So I want to read that because I think it's an important thing to see. So Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God. We just heard that, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, and it was called one day. Okay, so that's Genesis 1-5, and it starts out similar. In the beginning, in the beginning, God. And in John 1, it's in the beginning, God was there. And Jesus was there, the living expression. Jesus Christ was there from the beginning. He didn't just get created. He was the creator. So we see in Genesis 1, 1 through 5, he made the heavens and the earth. He spoke these things into existence. The light became what we saw. In verse uh, 
3, it says, and through his creative inspiration, this is in John now, the living expression made all things. So he had to have been there, right? Because he made all things. So why is this important? For nothing has existence apart from him. Life came into being because of him. For his life is what? Light. Let there be light. God spoke things into existence. He spoke himself into existence. That the light that we see, that correlation between light and darkness, right? He began to set things up from the beginning of time. From the beginning of time as we understand it, as we know it, to experience him as the light of the world. It's actually really deep if you think about it. John just, just describes him over and over again as light, the creator. Nothing came into existence without him. It's super important that we understand that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit were there from the very beginning. I'm going to go back to verse 2. It says, they were there together face to face. <laughs> What are the implications of that? That the Godhead wasn't in this hierarchical relationship, but they were there together, face to face. Later on, we'll read in John 17 that Jesus prays to the Father on our behalf. But the same relationship that Jesus had with the Father, with the Spirit, that we would have. If you take that all the way back to John 1, 2, and we look at it and go, what is your relationship like? It's face to face. I just want to sit and say love on that for a second. Face to face. Is that a distant God? Is that a God who wants to, you know, lord over you and rule over you with anger? Is he mean and distant? No, he's face to face, coming close. Let's relate to one another. I think that's a mind-blowing thing. We don't even think about, you know, anything. In the church or in family, in work situations, we just can't fathom that there isn't a hierarchy, can we? And it doesn't mean that there isn't someone who isn't leading. Leadership is not a hierarchy. It's not, I'm better than you, I'm more important than you, I'm... You understand what I'm saying? So if the Godhead is modeling, face-to-face -face interaction, connectivity, what do you think they want for us? I think sometimes we go, well, God is more important than Jesus. That's not the way it is. It says they were there together from the beginning, face-to-face. -face. Am I okay? Are you guys okay? Okay. Relating this even to Genesis 1, it goes all the way back to what we have from the written word and says, Jesus clearly is the one. He was there from the beginning. It calls out that prophetic promise of the invisible God being made visible to us. So, we have the face-to-face -face encounter. God is having the face-to-face -face encounter with one another. We're invited into that. And then we hear suddenly about a man who appears on the scene. Not this John who wrote the book, a different John. John the Baptist. And his whole reason for coming on the scene 
was to be a witness to point people to the light. John is much like the Father saying, let there be light. He's speaking it in the desert. He's speaking it to anyone who will listen. Hallelujah. Let there be light. And he's, he's calling him. He's preparing the way. He's, he's beckoning people to come and be hungry to experience the light of truth. And I want to read out of um, Luke 1. There's a prophetic word that his father, John the Baptist's father, speaks over him. And tells him, as a baby in the temple, this is what you're going to do, son. And you should go and read the whole story because it's a really cool story. But Zechariah who did not believe that John would even come on the scene because he was old. And he, he, he just, he lost his, he lost the prophetic hope, really, of this promised son to he and his wife. But when the prophetic hope became a reality, he was just in unbelief. And so, now he's holding the prophetic promise in his hands, and he begins to declare this prophecy over him. This is in Luke 1, verse 76. It's a lot of verses in that chapter. He says, And I prophesied, my little son, you will be known as the prophet of the glorious God, for you will be a forerunner, going before the face of the Master Yahweh, to prepare hearts to embrace his ways. You will preach to his people the revelation of salvation life, the cancellation of all our sins, to bring us back to God. The glorious, I'm sorry, the splendor light of heaven's glorious sunrise is about to break upon ah. us in holy visitation. All because the merciful heart of our God is so very tender. That's an amazing prophecy over your son, isn't it? Made me think of last Sunday. How many of you were here last Sunday? Do you remember when Dad said, I just feel like there's this thing if you want to step into the spirit of John the Baptist. And it was like out of left field. And people, res like more than half of the church, probably three quarters of the church, responded. So I just want to bring a little clarity to that. That verse that I just read, I'm going to read it over you again. As though it's part of, part two of that prophetic declaration that he made on Sunday. If you said yes to that, this is what the outcome of that response and a yielded life to be one of those forerunners looks like. So, I want you to just, if you said yes to that response last week, I want you to close your eyes and hear the Father say something. <laughs> and to you I prophesy, my children, you will be known as the prophets of the glorious God, for you will be a forerunner going before the face of the Master Yahweh to prepare hearts to embrace his ways. You will preach to his people the revelation of salvation life, and hear this, the cancellation of all our sins to bring us back to God. The splendor light of heaven's glorious sunrise is about to break upon us in holy visitation. Yes. All because the merciful heart of our God is so very oh. yes. John the Baptist, in this section in John, Verses 6 through 8, they're all about John the Baptist and his message to prepare and point the way to Jesus. And the disciple John is describing how John the Baptist's whole thing is to point people to the light, which I already said. But many thought that John himself was the Messiah. And he was like, no, it's not me. Yeah. I am here to simply point you to God, to point you to the one who is far greater than me. We have a little bit different um, commission because Christ is in us. We're not to say, I'm God, I'm the Messiah. But we're to look like Jesus. We have a different commission than John, right? John the Baptist. So while our, our motivation and what we do, the intent is still the same, to bring people to the light, to shine the light in the dark places, to prepare the way of the Lord for people to encounter Jesus. We don't just have to do it with our words, 
with shouting in the desert, with our, you know, I can't say that word right now, eccentricities, with our weirdness. Some of you like your weirdness, and it's fine. But that in and of itself is not going to point people to experience the Father. It's the things that Jesus commissioned us to do, to do the greater things, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to raise the dead, to proclaim the good news, the acceptable year of the Lord, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon you because he has anointed you to bring it, right? So we get to be like John the Baptist and do those things, but he's actually in us. We're not just doing it off of a prophetic promise in hopes and, and, and waiting for the prophetic promise. It has happened. Jesus has come. He's made his appearance on the scene, and now his spirit is in us. Does that make sense? Isn't that exciting? I think it is. So I just challenge you for the next little while, read Luke 1, 76 through 78 over yourself. And say, this is what God is commissioning me to do right now on the earth. <sighs> John, in verses 10 through 11, says that Jesus came to his own, but they did not recognize him. The very people that he created to have relationship with, the very people that he thought of when he was face to face, Those same people that were in his eye, face to face with the Godhead, no! recognized him. Jesus. Why should they have recognized him? Anybody have a guess? Why should those people, the Jewish people of Jesus' day, why should they have recognized him? Bingo. There was a lot of things that were right, but that's the one that... There was so much prophetic foretelling of Jesus. The word says that the... Um, and I can't remember, I just, I just... I can't remember the reference right now, but there's a portion of it when Jesus was appearing on the scene. It says that the atmosphere of the children of Israel, they were expectant. They were looking... The, the atmosphere was charged and excited, ready for the Messiah to come. I read that, you know, that was one of the most um, well-versed times in understanding the Torah and the prophetic promises. And they, it was an honor to learn that and to be taught that. They knew all of the prophetic promises. And there's many, many, many. They're, it would take me all day to go through those. But just two of them, Isaiah, they are very familiar with the prophecies in the book of Isaiah. And it, Isaiah 7 starts it right out. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, it says, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Here John is pro prophesying about the light. They recognize something different about John. And he says, no, I'm not him. The one that's coming is the light of the world. So here, they already have prophetic promises about the light. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, and there will be no end to his kingdom. And they have this in their hearts, and all of the other prophecies, Micah, all of the other ones, um, the prophets that had been proclaiming who Jesus was. <laughs> Jesus' life is the only one that could line up with all of those prophetic words. It's true. And they didn't maybe have all of the, the intel about who Jesus was and his story fully until he came on the scene doing the miracles and and even some of it happened after his death and resurrection. But it's super important that we recognize the incarnation part of who Jesus is. It, 
it solidifies that Jesus is the Christ. He is the one that was prophesied. So what areas in our own life do we not recognize Jesus? I think that's a question to ask ourselves today. It says that they were very familiar with the promise. They were the very ones he created. They were expecting, looking for him, waiting for him, even trying to make other people, other prophets, other, other ones. Are you the Messiah? Are you, it wasn't like they were just complacent, not looking for him. What are the things in our own life, when the move of God comes, when Jesus shows up on the scene, what are the things that would get in our way of our preconceived notions of who he is, what it should look like, what it should be, that we might not recognize him? Because I think that they were looking for a king. I think that they were looking for Thor to come in with his hammer, to be a stud muffin on a horse, and to set up his kingdom and his throne. And when he was a humble baby, in a manger, well, that's not right. When he's the servant of all, well, that couldn't be. When he speaks to those that no one speaks to, that's not, that's not the king I'm looking for. When he talks to women, Samaritan ones, is that? You know, I like the, the stories and the accounts of who Jesus was on the scene didn't match up with their preconceived expectations. So today I want to say to us, what are the things that we would hold up here as this is God, this is godly, this is what it looks like for a visitation? We want to recognize him, right? Yeah. In the littlest things, in the daily things, and also in the big revival explosion things. We want to, we want to encounter the living expression. Okay, let's jump into verse 14. This is my favorite one. This is the one that's really alive to me right now. And I love it in the Passion, for sure, but definitely the message is my favorite. The Word became flesh. The Word became flesh and blood. What's flesh and blood? Human. But to me, when you say they're my own flesh and blood, what is that? Family. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I love that. Could you be any more describing of who Jesus is? He became family. He became human. He became like us. And he moved into my neighborhood. And he moved into your neighborhood. And he did life in the hood. And so verse 14 in the Passion says, So the living expression became a man, and he lived among us. And we gazed upon the splendor of his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, overflowing with tender mercy and truth. I love that. Why is that so important? Why does it matter that he became one of us? Feel free to shout it out. Don't be shy. Gives us hope for overcoming. Somebody said something else over here. We can relate to him. Any others? Those are all great. Wasn't unapproachable. Yeah. We could keep going. There's a lot more. He was a mainstream Jew, but he was relatable. He was approachable. Any others? Why is it? Personalize it for yourself. I want you to think right now. Why does it matter that God became flesh and blood to me? Put yourself in that question. Calvin, why does it matter that Jesus was flesh and blood to you? Relatability. Relatability, right? Okay. We can be friends. We can be face to face. You don't all have to share your answer, but I want you to hear an answer. Why does it matter that God became human, that he became flesh and blood to you? Just close your eyes and think about it for a second. If you know, you'll relate to him so differently. He can 
empathize with us. That's a huge one right there. You know, how many times do people say, you know, I can't come to God, I'm dirty, I'm, you know, I'm sinful, I'm bad, I'm this, I'm that. You know, he's God and I'm man. Right, he is. But he was God and he was man. He actually left that. We were talking about this in our worship team gathering on Thursday. He actually left the face-to-face -face to come and do life as a human so that we could even empathize with him all the more. He left that intimacy to trudge it out in the desert. You read the stories in all the different Gospels. He was tempted in every way. There is not one thing that, you know, culturally, it's a little different now. He doesn't know what it's like to have a smartphone, you know? <laughs> I mean, when he was on the earth, they didn't have smartphones. <laughs> that, I mean, we can make these arguments. Oh, yeah, you don't know. You don't know what it's like. You don't live my life now. But the truth is, is he, he did live as a man. Amen. He lived a crazy life. Can you imagine creating, let's just say Charlotte. Okay, I created Charlotte. I know everything about her. And now I'm going to humble myself in my you know, divinity and come and put myself inside of Charlotte, immaculate conception. She's going to birth me now. I'm going to be birthed, which is probably really traumatizing for babies, <laughs> if you think about it. I'm going to be birthed. I'm going to have my diaper changed. I'm going to be nursed. I'm going to be taught how to be fed, taught how to speak how to walk, how to live. What a humbling thing, right? It's pretty crazy if you think about it. The sacrifice from there, that's, that's the first sacrifice that he made for us. He did, he subjected himself to us. He subjected himself to the process of life. When you feel like your process is more than you can handle, just remember that the living expression, the full expression of God, God, from the very beginning, has walked the same process that you've walked. He had a job. He had a community. He had friends. He faced disappointment. He faced lies told about him. He faced torture. He took on stuff that wasn't his own to take on. I mean, we could just keep going. It's pretty mind-blowing that the Word himself, the living expression, the eternal Word, the creative Word, the all-consuming, like, the everything Word, became flesh and blood and moved into our space. It's mind-blowing. Again, how does that make you feel, knowing that God lived the life that you live? As Jesus. What does that say about the heart of this God? That we feel like, I don't know if I can come in. I don't know if I want to give myself to him. That we can trust you. We can trust him. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. That's right. He cares about every ounce of your life. So, when we look at the story of John, and we're going to keep diving into John's story of Jesus, but when we look at it, Jesus is going to unfold to us the full expression of who God truly is. That's what it says in verse 18. That he unfolds now he has unfolded to us the full explanation of who God truly is. 
When we look at Jesus, when we look at his life, when we look at his character, when we look at his nature, we see God. And Jesus said it many times. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We are one. He and I, and I and he. Face to face. Fully connected. One God. You can go back into the Old Testament and it says, The Lord our God is one. Jesus truly is God. He is God with us. He's God in us. He's God as one of us. That's one of the meanings of Emmanuel, God as one of us, acquainted with everything. We can truly see who God is, and not just who he is, but his heart for humanity. I'm going to read um, a paraphrased version of this chapter again. This is not, this is not like canonized Bible or anything. This is one man's um, paraphrase of this passage of scripture. His name is Baxter Kruger. He's a really interesting theologian. Um, and I'm just going to read this and then we're going to close. I'm pressing for you to read this up. But if you guys want to come and just get ready, we're going to do we're going to sing a song. But this is um, the Gospel of St. John 1, 1 through 18, paraphrased by Baxter Kruger. Dr. Baxter Kruger. Case you need his PhDs to make me feel better about his words. Before the time of the beginning, the Word was face to face with God. He was there before the ages, in intimate union with God, and fully God. Everything that it came to be came to be in Him, and not one thing has existence apart from Him. In the word, life was and came to be. And this life is light, the true origin and meaning of human life. I think that's a deep statement right there. This life, this light, Jesus Christ, is the true origin and meaning of human life. I think that's pretty deep. Like, who God created us to be all the way back to the garden? We can see that when we read it, when Adam and Eve come on the scene, face to face, they walk with Jesus, with the Godhead, I should say, in intimate relationship. And that's the way he always meant it to be. Jesus restores the true origin and meaning of life. So, back to Baxter's words. And the light of life shines in the gloom of darkness. Don't you, aren't you thankful for that? There is a gloom of darkness that's over our nation no. that's, that we encounter every day when we go off to the places of the earth. Yeah. But there is a light of life that shines in the gloom of darkness. And even though the darkness doesn't understand the light, neither can it stop it from shining. That's powerful. Let me skip the part about John. I'm going to jump down to verse 14. No, I'm not. Never mind. Suddenly in the darkness a man appeared, sent out from the presence of God, and his name was John. And he came to be the witness the witness to the light of life that everyone might see and believe. John was not the light, but he was its witness. And the true light who enlightens every person born into the earth was already there in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world was unaware and did not perceive him. He came to his own people and they didn't recognize him or receive him. Yet, this is for all of us, yet those who embrace him who believe in his name, who find his light. His I am, setting them free to become their true selves. Free to live as children of God, in the darkness, yet discovering their origin beyond their earthly parents, in and through the word of God. 
the word in God, I should say, I'm sorry. And so the word became flesh and entered the darkness in person, found his way within us. And when we perceived his true identity, his glory as the only begotten out of the Father, an overflowing fountain of grace and truth. This is what, God, what John was sent to show us about Jesus, that he existed from the beginning. He existed before the ages, before John himself. And out of his fullness, Jesus' fullness, we were born and we're now being liberated. Just declare that over you this morning. You are now being liberated. For the law came through Moses, but through Jesus Christ has come the true exodus into grace, into a grace-filled reality, and into the very bosom of the Father, where the only begotten Son dwelt face to face with his Father. That's the life that we're invited into when we embrace this man, Jesus. And I just want to, before we sing this song, I just want to ask if there's anyone that wants to, even maybe for the first time, let the light of who God is shine inside of them and say, yes, I want to acknowledge, I want to receive you. I want to experience this face-to-face -face thing with a not very distant God with a God who's so close, so intimately acquainted with us, who knows every hair on our head, who thought of us, was compelled by that love to come and be one of us so that we could have that same relationship. Because sin did get in the way. It did get in the way in the garden. Our great, great, great grandparents chose sin. But the Father would not be pleased to have us at a distance. And so he made a way. And it took a while to get there. But because of the law, but because of Moses, but because of the things that we realized we could not do it on our own. When you read the Old Testament, that's what it's all about. To say, you know what? You could not get back to face to face on your own. I had to come. Jesus had to come. He had to become flesh. He had to become one of us. And he wants that relationship with you. And so he got rid of sin on the cross. He took it upon himself. He paid the price, got rid of it, so he could say, hey, let's get back to face to face. Man, I'm so thankful for that. Thank you. 
you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So right now, Father, I just declare that your light shine. I just thank you, Lord, that the light of your face shines on us. Face to face. The light of your face shines upon us. Come and shine on us right now, God, and speak to us. Just even as we encounter you in this place, we're going to sing this song, Reckless Love. And this is the Father. This is the Father that we know. This is Jesus that came running after us in every dark and gloomy place.